So we've seen that perpendicular lines have slopes that are negative reciprocals of each other. And the way we looked at this was we just saw some examples. And we saw, oh yeah, if the x value goes up here, the y value goes over up there. And we just kind of looked at it, and it just kind of looked right. Um, and for most of you, that's, that's fine. That's good enough. Um, but for part of the black level assignment, um, I want to actually prove that it must be true. So this is going to be an algebraic proof uh, where we'll calculate, and we're going to calculate it without any numbers. We're just going to say, well, if the slope of one of them was m1 and the slope of the other line was m2, then let's show that those numbers are negative reciprocals of each other. Um, so this is kind of, might be kind of a new experience for some of you to see a sort of formal proof of a statement. Um, so don't worry, it would be totally normal if you have to kind of go through it a few different times and look at all the steps one by one by one. Um, I hope you, uh, you kind of like it. It's one proofs are one of the great things about math that we can know for absolutely without a doubt that something's true. Um, at the end of the video, I'm going to give you a part of your assignment, which is to just do a slight modification on this proof, just to consider all the cases. All right, good luck with it. OK, so here's what we want to prove. Given two perpendicular lines, pro prove that their slopes are negative reciprocals of each other. Um, in other words, because uh, it's hard to prove that some certain words are true, so it's nicer if we can describe that as an equation. So if the slopes, if one of the slope is m1, this is in other words what we're trying to prove, we want to prove that that one is the upside down negative of m2 or the negative reciprocal. So what we do to get it upside down, or reciprocal, is we'll do 1 divided by m2. And to get it to be negative, we'll put it in the negative sign. So if we can we'll do some algebra and come up with this equation, that m1 is the upside down negative of m2, then we're good. Okay. Now there's a simplifying assumption we're going to make it, and it turns out that it's totally legitimate to make it. it. It's still true even if we don't make it, but it makes the calculations a little bit easier than if we do. And the assumption is we're going to assume that the two lines cross right at the origin, at 0, 0. So we'll draw them on here, and then we'll write that down. So there's one. I'll try to have the other one be in my sketch as close to perpendicular as I can. So we'll call this one L1, we'll call this one L2. Now let's write that down. So I'm going to write, without loss of generality, assume the lines intersect. at zero, zero. I'm going to put a star there. We'll come back to this in a bit. So what this means, without loss of generality, it means that I'm claiming that if this is true, if they intersect at zero, zero, then this, and this statement is true, then that statement is true no matter what. I'm saying that this doesn't really change anything. And this is actually going to be part of the homework to prove that it doesn't change anything. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, we're going to look at a point here. This is going to be the point that's over 1, so the x value is going to be 1. And the, if the slope of this line is m1, just because it's l1, so we'll call the slope m1, then when we go over 1, we go up m1. So that means that the y value of that point is m1. And then we'll look at this point here, which will also be the x value of 1. And then by the same token, if we go over 1, going up m1, in this case m1, oh, sorry, m2, because it's l2. And here that's probably, a, it's a negative number, but that's cool, it doesn't matter. Okay, we're going to look at this triangle. And because these are two perpendicular lines, this is a right triangle. So you might want to kind of tilt your head here. This is the hypotenuse. And then here's the right angle there. What we're going to do, let's write this down. 
because, oh, let's give these some names. Let's call this point A. We'll call this point B. And then this point we'll call O because it's at the origin. And it's at zero, zero. That's the only time you would ever really call a point O. Because triangle ABO is a right triangle, and again we know that because the lines are perpendicular. Because it's a right triangle, if you think, well, what do we know about right triangles? The one of the things that should pop into your head is, oh, the Pythagorean theorem. So it satisfies the Pythagorean theorem. I'll use THM for theorem. So what we have is that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Where a and b are the lengths of the sides of the two legs, and c is the length of the hypotenuse. Okay, now we're going to go to a little close-up, because we need to figure out how long are these. We're not going to get a number like 8, but we're going to get an expression that will have some numbers in it, and then either some m1s or some m2s. Okay. So I've just driven, drawn a close-up of that triangle there, just because otherwise it was getting a bit messy on the paper. So let's find length 1 first. Okay, this is going to be our a value later. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is another Pythagorean theorem in here. We've got this triangle here. We're going to use this triangle here to find L1. We know that this is the point 1M1, so this is 1 long. And this is up M1, so this is M1 long. So we've got that length 1. In this case, length 1 is the hypotenuse. Later it'll be one of the legs, but right now in that green triangle it's the hypotenuse. So length squared, length 1 squared, is equal to this side squared plus this side squared. So m1 squared. And then if I just wanted to know what length 1 was, I'll take the square root of both sides. I have length 1 equals the square root, and then 1 squared is 1 plus, and then I can't really do anything with this, so I'll leave that m1 squared. Okay, so this is a number that we're going to use later, 1 plus m1 squared. So that's the green length. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the red length down here. I'll use this red triangle, which is also a right triangle. So with Pythagorean theorem on this, length 2 now is the hypotenuse. Length 2 equals, this is, let's write that in pen. This side is the same side as before, that's 1 long. And this is m2 long. So the length of that is 1 squared plus, oh sorry, the length of this squared is 1 squared plus m2 squared. Okay. And now, to isolate length 2, I'll take the square root of both sides to undo that square. And I have length 2 equals, again, 1 squared is 1. So it's a square root of 1 plus m2 squared. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these two equations, the red one and the green one. I'm just going to use those values on the other side here, back here. And I just did this off to one side, this off to one side, just so it didn't mess up this page too much, just because there's a lot going on. So, my length one was this one up here. So this is, we have from here, right here, it's the square root of 1 plus m1 squared. And then down here, this side is the red side, so that's root 1 plus m2 squared. Okay. 
Okay, so we're back to here, and we've got this triangle, A, B, O. So our, the triangle that is um, in the line that we have two of the sides are our original perpendicular lines, and then the other side is just the side that connects them from where the x values are 1. Okay, because this is a right angle, because the lines are perpendicular, it satisfies the Pythagorean theorem. So we can say that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now this would be kind of interesting for you because it usually when you use the Pythagorean theorem you're trying to find the lengths of one of the sides. And we're not actually going to do that. We're going to put in expressions for all the sides. And we're going to use these equations to come out with, hopefully, this equation here. Okay, it's kind of elegant how it works. Okay, so let's substitute here. So this is our a value. So our a is the square root of 1 plus m1 squared, and we've got a squared, so we'll square that. Okay, and for b, this is our b value here, so it's root 1 plus m2 squared, and b squared is that thing squared. Now for c, we didn't do c. Didn't do it over on the other page. It turns out it's pretty. It's a lot easier than the other ones. Um, what it is, it's the difference between how high m1 is and how high m2 is. Okay. So it's just m1 take away m2. So m1 take away m2 squared. Okay, so I've got my Pythagorean theorem here, and I know the lengths of all the all the sides. But I'm hoping to come out with this equation out of it in a bit. It doesn't look, it doesn't really look like it's the same thing, but it's uh, kind of interesting how it comes out. Okay, so over here, the squaring and the square rooting undo each other. So we've got 1 plus m1 squared. And then same thing here. So we've got 1 plus m2 squared. And over here, if you like, you can write this out twice and then uh, use distributivity to multiply everything by everything else. I'll just do that in one step. So I've got m1 squared, and then my middle term is going to be 2 times m1 times m2 plus m2 squared. So if that doesn't make sense to you, then just pause the video and then multiply this out yourself, and you'll see that you come up with that. Okay. Um, now if we look at this, we actually have some terms that are common on both sides. I've got m1 squared over here, and I have another m1 squared here. So I'll subtract that from both sides, and it'll go away. And there's one other term, that, term that's common. I've got an m2 squared here, and another one here. So I'll subtract that as well, and that goes away. So I'll write down what we've got left here. Oh, there we just have 2. That's quite a lot nicer looking. And then here we have negative 2, m1, m2. So that looks quite a lot simpler than it did a minute ago. And this actually kind of looks sort of plausible that we could come up with this. In fact, what we do, I'm going to take this, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2, and I'm actually also going to divide them by m2. It's not super obvious that you'd want to do that, but it seems reasonable, that you totally can if you want. And then actually this is the super important moment right here. Because here are negative 2 divided by negative 2, so that's gone. It's 1. And we've got m2 divided by m2, so that's gone. And all we've got left here, look at this, is m1. Look at that. And then let's see what we've got here. Positive divided by negative, so it's negative. And then 2 divided by 2 is 1, so those are gone. So on the top we just have 1. And on the bottom... We have m2. So there it is, right there. Take a look at that. So we've just proven, and you may well want to go watch this video over a few times, um, and try to do some of the parts on your own. To pause it and try to do the next step, and then see what I do. Pause it and do the next step. But what we've done was we assume that two lines were perpendicular, and then without loss of generality, I'll come back to that in a second, we assume they intersected the origin. We drew a little right angle triangle here, and then we use the Pythagorean theorem, the fact that that's true, 
to come out with the fact that their slopes must be negative reciprocals. So here that's the end of the proof right there. And then we put a little, this is a nice little symbol, a little box with an X through it. That means, there, we did it. We proved it. I just want to make a note of one thing, and then we'll come back to this without loss of generality. The only thing, the only case that the way this doesn't work is if one of the sides, sorry, one of the lines has a slope of zero, and the other one has an undefined slope. And the reason that doesn't work is because on the vertical line, you can't find the spot that's over one. Okay, so the other kind of lines that are the only case that this doesn't cover is if you have a vertical line and a horizontal line. Okay. So, now this asterisk. As part of the assignment for section 6.2, I want you to prove that this statement is true. So this statement is this statement. Even if the lines don't intersect at 0, 0. Okay, so here's how you do this. So first of all, you make sure that you really understand that proof first. And you watch it a few times. Um, and then you draw a diagram where you've got these points. The lines are crossing at just any point x and y. And I call them x naught, so x with a little zero, and y naught. Um, just because often we'll do that in math to show that it would be a particular point. And then you redo the same idea. So you redraw the same diagram where you've gone over 1. So you draw the same diagram, you got that triangle there, we've gone over 1 here, and over 1 here. And you figure out, well, what would be the coordinates of that point and that point? Remembering that when we go over 1, we'll go up M1 and M2. And then you see, well, okay, how much, this will turn out actually to be really similar. Um, not identical, but really similar. And then you see if you can go all the way through the proof and come out with this same conclusion. So you can do this on your own if you like, you can do it on your f with a friend if you like. I would suggest you do the rest of the assignment for section 6.2 first, um, and then afterwards you come work on this proof. Okay, good luck. I think you'll do wonderfully.